Monkey is swallowing. Snake says swallowing. Next, a swallow too will fly and come and swallow. You ever swallow in a hollow galo, making a whole lot of halabalu. Jale galu, we know say you drop the money from, so give me the loot. Do you really want a revolution or just your turn? Hello, everyone. My name is Richard Ani, Nigerian writer, publisher, and a poet. And I am here to anchor this panel at the 2020 Ake Festival. My novel, City of Memories, was published in 2012 by Parisia Books, and my latest collection of uh, poetry, The Anguish and Vigilance of Teens, was published by Konya Shems Rumi in 2019. I've had the pleasure to work in the Nigerian and African literary spaces since about 2008, and even earlier than that. So it's always an absolute delight when we get to interact with people who we started off with five, 10, 15 years ago, and even um, longer than that, particularly when they are Nigerians who are making their names and making waves internationally. So without further ado, and it's an absolute pleasure to introduce our guest today, Ukamako Lisakwe. Ukamako Lisakwe is one of the most interesting and the most vibrant voices in African literature at present. She started writing way back in 2010, and her debut novel, Eyes of a Goddess, was published in 2016. What is on the table today for this panel is her latest book, Ogadimma, subtitled Everything Good Will Come. This is an interesting book in that it's, uh, it's really hot off the press, just coming out a few weeks ago with a Nigerian edition uh, on the way from Masube Books. The international edition has been published by Indi the Indigo Press in the UK, and uh, right now it's available for order and for sale. Hello, hi, Ukamaka. Hi, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be on this panel with you, and uh, congratulations on your new book, Ogadima. Thank you so much for this, Ari. Thank you. Okay, so uh, perhaps we can start with a personal introduction. You know, I think it's important to have writers uh, speak about themselves, considering that they talk about every other person, huh? you know, so writers are like busy bodies, huh? So um, tell us about Ukamako Lisakwe. All right. Um, so Ukamako Lisakwe is a mother, a writer, and a student. Um, I had my first book published in 2012, and between 2012 and 2020, I published some short stories, some personal essays, a few articles, and I wrote a TV series. And then currently, while I am also pursuing my literary career, I am very well steeped in academia. So I'm currently a PhD student um, on the creative track. Impressive, really impressive. Yeah. So, um, Ogadima is a new book, and I'm sure quite a number of your readers are eager to, to read it. I'm not sure if the Nigerian edition is out. I think it's out this month. Could you please honor us with a reading of the book? You know, something to set the scene for this discussion, perhaps. Okay, um, thank you so much. Uh, I will read from the first chapter. One. It was the early 80s. Around the time a group of senior army officers overthrew the democratically elected government, when Austrian lace and ashoke were trendy and church services were fashion shows, an endless, shameless carnival of women in colorful blouses blended with expensive ichafu, which they tied in layers and pleats until the scarves were piled atop their heads like large plants, obstructing the view of everyone seated behind them. Everyone looked forward to Sundays to go into church. Those who could not afford these processions snuck in very early for the children's service because that was the great, graceful thing to do, to worship with the children in their simple clothes of cheap blouses over Nigerian wasp and okrika shoes whose heels had worn out and made koi 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 sounds on the tired floor. It was on a Monday after one of those Sundays that Ogadema walked into Barista Chima's office for the first time. The room was empty. The fan whirled. 
scattering the papers on the cluttered desk. They floated to the floor, slid under the table, under the chair, by the door, and by her feet. She wondered if it would be awkward to walk in uninvited and pick them up. She knocked again, louder this time. Hello, she called out, her voice echoing. There was a click of heels. A girl emerged from the connecting door, her blue skirt so short she would not be comfortable if she were to bend over to get the papers. The name tag pinned to her white blouse said she was Amara. What do you want? She asked, her gaze piercing. Your papers, Ogadima pointed to the floor. But Amara wrinkled her nose, ignoring the scattered sheets, arching an eyebrow. I am looking for Barista Chima, Ogadima said, bringing out the business card her father gave her, holding it up for Amara to see. Come in, Amara said, waving her into the waiting room. And only after Ogadima had gone in did Amara crouch, carefully, not bent, because she could never bend without exposing her underwear to pick up the scattered papers. When her father described the address, Ogadema had expected a proper workplace, or at least a hall split into cubicles. She had never been in a barrister's office, and so she did not know what the place would look like. But this was anything but an office. It was a typical two or three bedroom flat, the same model many houses around the area replicated. Without being told, she knew that the waiting room was originally designed to be a parlor, that the connecting door led to Barista Chima's office, which most likely had a master's toilet. A small TV, half the size of her family's Philips black and white TV, was locked away in a metal cage knocked into the wall. She resisted the urge to laugh, because who on God's earth would want anything to do with that toy? Amara returned but headed straight for the barrister's office. Barrister Chima will see you after he is done attending to the client inside, she said after she reemerged, an exaggerated air of importance about her. Ogadema began to say thank you, but Amara was already coy coy away. She looked no more than 17 or 18, perhaps a secondary school leaver like Ogadema who was passing time as a receptionist while waiting for a university admission letter. A short, bespectacled man walked in and took the seat opposite. Ogadema greeted him, but the man did not respond. Soon, other visitors arrived, some wearing long faces, others tapping their feet impatiently after a few minutes. Ogadema wondered what cases they were battling or if they had also come to seek Barista Chima's help with things like getting an admission into a university. She opened her bag and brought out her jump result, 240, good enough to get her an admission into the state university. But her father had wanted her to study in the East, so she had chosen the University of Nsuka, University of Nigeria in Nsuka. Nsuka was a place they barely knew, plus, Often, the number of students that passed the exam exceeded the capacity a code could admit, so it was customary to go through people who knew powerful staff in the university, why they needed Barista Chima's help. She folded the test result into her bag. The room had filled to bursting. Visitors were sitting, standing, hanging by the door. A man came out of Barista Chima's office, dragging a walking stick. He adjusted his glasses and made for the reception. Amara went into the office and returned seconds later. Barista Chima will see you now, she told Ogadema. Her skirt had reading higher up her thighs. The barrister was seated behind his desk, his head bent over a sheaf of paper, the room chilled to freezing point, the shelves cluttered with law books. Good morning, sir, Ogadema said and stood waiting for the invitation to sit. He lifted his head, a man not much older than her father, but with features so striking it was as though his face was chiseled out of fine wood, his skin the color of roasted groundnut husk. He waved her over to the only chair across the desk and held her gaze with eyes that made her forget how to speak, how to move. She became conscious of her outfit, 
the loose skirt that stopped at her ankles, her cornrows that were old and fuzzy. Her heart was cutting hard. Good morning, sir, she said again, folding her hands on her lap. She could not hold his gaze, and so she stared at a spot on his chest. How old are you? he said. I am 17. You don't look 17 at all. She waited for him to say how old she looked. He didn't. Instead, he went on to ask her questions about her visit, who sent her, who her father was. I have never met him, he said. His tone was dismissive. I don't know how he got my card. He was speaking too fast. Ogadima wanted to explain that her father got the contact through a customer who spoke highly of Barista Chima. But the words were clogged in her throat. He was talking too fast. He was in a haste to send her on her way, or he was orchestrating this to make her feel miserable. She moved closer to the edge of her chair. Her hands held out, and when she spoke, she could barely hear herself. Help me, please. I don't want to stay at home for one more year doing nothing, she said, her hands still bunched together. Please help me, sir. He was looking at her, his eyes unblinking. Ogadima lowered her eyes, dug her fingernails into her palms. There was a knock on, and then the door opened. Amara looked in, passed a curious glance at her before turning to her boss. Madame Afuecheta is here. I have told her to wait. She is crying, Amara said. Marista Chima nodded and Amara left. When he spoke again, his words were slower. I am going to attend to a desperate client. Will you come back by three so we can talk about this admission you seek? She was bobbing her head even before he was done talking. Yes, sir. I will come back by three. Thank you so much, sir. But he had returned to the sheaf of papers, her cue to leave. She thanked him again, furiously. When she walked into the hot waiting room, she was so giddy she almost stumbled. She was able to breathe again. I'll stop here. Uh, lovely. Thank you. Thank you so much for that reading. My first question is on uh, technical issues of, of craft. When I read your novel, I imagine that some deliberation went into the choice of uh, point of view. I imagine the first person point of view might have worked quite well, but you chose a closed third person point of view. What went into this decision? Um, yeah, thank you so much for that, Christian. Um, at first, when I started writing the first draft of the book, I wrote it using the first person POV and point of view, but then it wasn't working for me because um, the character he, herself, Olga Dilma, went through a lot in the book. And she experienced one of the worst hardships. She endured violence that I can't even wrap my head around. But then I realized something was happening with the first person point of view. She was so absorbed, absorbed in her experience. Oh, she was so sad. She was so saddened and she, she became one dimensional to me. So I had to start all over again because one thing I don't want to do is as much as she endured a lot in the book, I don't want her to come off as a victim. And I also wanted the reader to have access to her interiorities, to also understand the reason why things happening to her were happening to her, and also to understand the mentality or maybe the psychological makeup of those around her, especially her community. Um, as a girl who grew up in a very conservative community in Kano State and was raised by a father who is very um, patriarchal and had this idea of what feminine sanctity should be. So I wanted the reader to have sort of um, a 360 view of that particular world. And if I went ahead and continued in that first person narrative, we will only be seeing what Ogadema wants us to see. So I had to change course. And what I did was then to use a closed dirt and occasionally I would step, like pull the camera away from Ogadema so that we get and it kind of a clear understanding of what was happening. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I remember uh, roughly a decade ago when we worked on your story, Girl to Woman, uh, which was published in the Sentinel Nigeria magazine, which is now defunct. Uh, the last 10 years has been very, very full of activity for you and a lot of accolades as well. You know, your debut novel, Eyes of a Goddess, Getting on the Africa 39 list, and now this book, which has been published uh, internationally and in Nigeria. 
So uh, in your words, please speak about your development as a writer. Yeah, that's one hard question. My development. Yeah, I think what happened, I started very, um, I had this altruistic idea of what writing should be. And way back in 2010, 2011, I was more interested in writing about the self and writing about um, things that were just too close to me and seeing them from kind of a narrow lens. Um, and that and that was because of the, the, the kind of books I read then, the kind of exposure I had. But then over the course of the years, I, I got introduced into the Nigerian literary community, the wider Nigerian literary community, especially on Facebook. And I, um, I began to read different materials, different texts from other writers from around the continent, not just Nigeria. And that changed my perspective of what writing should be. And then um, when I went on to pursue an MFA in creative writing, I realized then um, something was, cha was changing in my story, not just uh, because uh, if I compare what I was doing way back when I started in 2010, 2011, 2012, and to what I am doing now, I realized back then I was much more interested in the emotional content of the story. But now I am more deliberate with what I am doing on craft level, um, the choices I have to make stylistically, um, the kind of voice I would want my character to adopt depending on their circumstance. So that's, that is what has changed. So I moved away from writing, placing more emphasis on the emotional content, on the, on the plot, to now the craft level, um, being very deliberate with what I'm doing on craft level. So that's what has changed over the years. Okay, uh, yeah, so that's that's quite um, understandable. Um, one of the problems, all right, and I use problems in quotes only, is that you've written this book so well and achieved your characterization so well that we forget that the central character, Oga Dima herself, is just 17. I mean, she's a child, really, when this novel starts. So uh, I understand that this is a sort of coming of age story, but there's also another sense where the youth of this central character uh, has been stolen from her. If, if we look at it this, this way, you know, by way of organizing society, patriarchy, uh, some sort of patriarchy. Um, Ukamaka, child marriage is a serious issue in Nigeria, isn't it? Uh, what are your thoughts about this issue of child marriage, especially as it relates to your novel? You know, I I was born in Kano State. I grew up in Kano State, and then I moved to southeastern Nigeria after I married my husband. And then uh, further down the years, I had to move away from home and now live in the United States. I noticed something happening each time we talk about child marriages in Nigeria. Um, our fingers usually are pointed toward the northern part of Nigeria. Um, or even when you do a quick Google search about child marriages in Nigeria, it's always, oh, the northern part of Nigeria. But I think that um, that story, it's not completely true. Because I say this because I come from a community where girls marry as young as 14, 15, 16. I mean, I'm talking about women in my family, women in my smaller community in southeastern Nigeria. So what I try to do is kind of add a bit to that conversation because what happens is, what happens when, what happens every time we point the finger to just the north is that we sort of erase the experiences of the women down southeastern Nigeria. We don't talk about their, yeah, we don't talk about our own lived reality. And when we don't talk about those things, we don't give it a face. And when we don't give it a face, we don't, we, we are ignorant of the problem of the troubles. I mean, I'm now speaking from a personal experience, um, knowing women in my family who married as early as 14, 15, 16, 17, um, and what they all went through. We don't talk about that in the, in the wider community, in the, in the wider literary community. So what I did with Ogadima is to add to the conversation, is to say that what we have in the North is true. We also have that in Southeastern Nigeria. We should talk about these things. They, they are still happening today. So we should not just um, have an idea or a stereotype of what a particular side of our Nigerian is doing, but also to look and examine ourselves. Because when we begin to examine ourselves, we'll find we we'll then have to forge 
a new path and find solutions to our own problem. Yeah, so that's what I did with Dr. Denma to add to the conversation to give to give not just the outsider, but even in a typical Nigerian living in Nigeria, a different perspective of what child marriages means to the woman living in southeastern Nigeria. Yeah, okay, yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you for that. Uh, something curious is that Ogadima is set in 1980s Nigeria, basically the 1980s. Why that period particularly? You know, we've had a, a bit of recent prose from the country, which has been set in the shadows of the Abacha days or the mining of Civil War histories and experiences. And, but in the 80s, we had a democratic government and then we had two different military regimes. There, there was quite a bit going on. So, but my question is, why did you set uh, Ogadima in the 1980s? Why? Um, it was a really personal decision. Two things. The first thing is, it doesn't matter if I set Ogadima in the 80s or if I set Ogadima in the 90s or in the 2000s. The struggle is still real. Patriarchy is still a disease that we are fighting that has eaten so deeply into our fabric. I mean, just today I went on Twitter, just scrolled into my feed, feed and I saw something trending. Young Nigerian men actually trending Patriarchy FC. And it's so saddening that they even um, registered a website. Uh, they registered a domain called Patriarchy FC or something, something like that. I just had to log off. I mean, we are talking about 2020 and we have men, uh, we have a sort of Olympics going on on Twitter, men bragging about being mean to women. So it, it doesn't matter if I said other oh, Ma in the 80s, those, those situations that she endured. I mean, even, even one of the stories I had to read on Twitter, it's a man bragging about, talking about how, how um, labor pains for pregnant women aren't uh, as severe as we make it to be. And that was so sad, especially for a woman like me who endured postpartum trauma three times. You know, so it doesn't matter if it is set in whatever time period in the Nigerian history, our struggles are still real. But then on secondly, the reason why I decided to do that is because Ogadima is really a love letter to my community. It's really me attempting to reinvent the stories of the women I grew up knowing, the women in my community who married as such tender ages. And there's something, there's a bit of similarity, only the only similarity between me and them, those women in my family is that I also married when I was just 19. And, and this, is, this is me adding to the conversation. This is me um, remembering those women and most of them got married in the early 80s, the late 70s, early 80s, and also toward the late 90s. So I decided to do that, um, to situate Ogadema in the 80s, to as sort of a remembrance for all the women in my community who were shipped off to much older men um, in the name of marriage. Yeah, so that was, that was the very personal decision I did. But then on the other hand, it, it doesn't really matter where I set it because the situation, we, we still are experiencing them today. Uh, thank you for that, Tukamaka. Um, your your novel is physically set in Kano. Forgive me for talking about setting, you know, but um, your novel is physically set in Kano, and I've read some of your fiction prior to this and your nonfiction, and these have also been set around the city of Kano. I was born in that city, and I believe so were you in uh, Sabongari. Uh, for me personally, Joss is home and it looms large in how I see myself, in what I write. You know, I think our listeners, that's the people who are attending this, this, uh, this session, would be interested in hearing about your own Kano. Why Kano? Uh, uh, and then what does a hometown mean? What does Kano mean to you, Azuka Maka? Hmm. I moved away from Kano in 2001. Um, and it's been, how many years? It's been 19 years, Richard. It's been 19 years since I left Kano State and I still haven't fallen out of love with that particular state. So when I, when I moved to Abba in Abia State in 2001, in 2000, late 2001, December 2001, it took me, it would take me, or it took me 15 years, around 15 years 
before I could see other places in my dreams. Because what happened over the years was each time I close my eyes and I just drift away and, and I find myself in dreamland, the setting is in Kano State. Like I would literally close my eyes on my bed in Abba and I will find myself on my bed in Kano State. And this happened over and over and over. It took a while, almost 15 years, before I, I could stop seeing Abba and Kano State and began seeing Abba. So what happened is each time I'm setting my story, I, it naturally calls to me. That city draws me in. Um, it was where I had one of my, most of my fondest memories, um, where I, I had these big ideas, big dreams of who I wanted to be. I had a community um, of young women like me, young girls like me, who were wild, who were nasty, who were messy, who were ambitious, until marriage happened and pulled us away. Um, yeah, so that's why I keep returning to Kano. And then what saddens me is um, this still ongoing political conversation in Nigeria about what state of origin is. Because I would really like to include Kano State as my state of origin, because that was where I was born. That was where I had my fondest memory, my hometown in Abagana in Anambra State. I only, I only would visit maybe once every two years with my parents when we traveled home, when we traveled home for Christmas and New Year. And that that happened to just be there for two weeks and then we returned to Kano State. So my best memories were spent in Kano. And yeah, that's why I keep returning to Kano State. I don't think I will ever stop. I will keep returning to that state. It's a very complex, quite conservative, but very beautiful place with so much diversity in cultures and in peoples. Yeah, so that's why you keep seeing Kano State in my stories. <laughs> Kano, Kode me Kazo Amfika. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um yeah, so you know, uh does this does this place in Edward Said's book on beginnings and methods where he talks about beginnings being very deliberate places, and I believe he also meant this in terms of literary beginnings. So how did you begin? You know, you know this idea, writers, uh, especially they, they recreate themselves, right? Uh, there's always that interplay between their own talent and then the influence of other people. I'd love to hear about your own literary beginnings. What aided that decision to write? You know, who were your key literary influences? Who were your favorite writers? Why those ones? I'd, I'd, I'd really like to hear that. Yeah, um, so I told you I started writing officially in 2010. Um, before then, I was reading mostly mainstream American and British um, literatures. I, I tried, experimented writing stories um, of young girls, but then I couldn't immerse them in the worlds I was reading because, of course, uh, that would be occupied, well, those worlds were or are still occupied by blonde young women who don't, um, who don't have fufu or who don't eat a nubu soup. And then um, something happened in 2009. Um, after I started working in a different um, Nigerian bank, I met a friend online. You will know him, Felix Abraham Sobi. And then he introduced me to a variety of African literatures. He actually shipped some books to me and I started reading them and I began to like something opened in my mind and I realized that there are certain stories that I want to I want to write stories that I knew that I could tell that I that I've been longing to tell I found an avenue to tell them. Um, some of those works included um Buchi Mechatas and the Joys of Motherhood, Second Class Citizen, Flora Matas Ifuru, um even everything by Amata, Amata I do, Bessie Head. So I had read all of those literatures and they gave me the permission to tell the story I wanted to tell. I don't think I would have um, written Ogadinma if I hadn't read those stories because they mostly talk about family, what it means to be a woman, her place of belonging in that society. And over the years, I also read um, like Lola Shonayin's The Secret Life of Abashabi's Wives, you know, Rich Mamanda, everything by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. 
So those women, and then most recently, my favorite writer in the entire world now, like nobody's competing with her, is uh, Leslie Neka Arima. So those women, um, they, they had all the validation I need and all the um, encouragement I need to tell the stories I want to tell. Um, with Arima, I began to pay attention to what I am doing on craft level because, oh my God, she's the master planner. Like she's so mathematical in her crafting of every single story that you would read it over and over again and you're trying to piece all the puzzles that she could go through generations in just one very short, compact, so that one was short stories and you wonder what the hell is happening here. Uh, so all so all the all those were like she's almost like a physician. Each time I describe her to friends, I'll be like, she's like a physician, she's cutting up things and then she's joining them and you're wondering, oh my god, what is she doing? Yeah, so those women, they um so for Arima, she she is a major influence when it comes to comes to what I'm doing most recently on craft level. Um Buchi Mecheta, Ramasha Neyi, Florangba Mata Aidu, Chika Onigwe, all those women, what they did for me is to tell me that it is okay to write about women. It is okay to center women in my stories. It is okay to relegate all the men to the background to make them the furniture in the story, <laughs> and yeah, and just talk about the fucking woman. And and it's okay also to write um, uh, about um, women, different what it means. What it, what does it even mean to to be a hero in a story? You know, we have this angelic view maybe fed to us by um, Hollywood of what it means to be a hero. You have to be a, that kind of exaggerated heroism, but which is not our reality. And which which also really frustrated me while I was writing um Ogadima, you know, she went through a lot of shit in that book. And and a reader, maybe a Western reader, will pick up this book and will be like, why did she have to go through all that? Well she the story is mirroring reality. It's mirror like it just too much. And sometimes I, I asked myself why don't you just fucking leave this man? But then the story kept fooling me because well in my community those women they stayed they stayed, they sat in it. And today, when we talk about our, our, our parents' generation, we'll be like, oh, our mother stayed in marriages for 50 years. But then we don't talk about what they endured. We don't talk about what it means to, to stay, to endure a lot of patriarchal bullshit. So we don't talk about it. So that's what Ogadema tried to do. But eventually she stood up and then she left. And, and that is maybe me trying to say that it is okay to walk away. It is okay to walk away from really toxic situations. It's okay to say enough, you know. But then, what I didn't want to do is to make her be the hero in the story, like this, especially this Americanized version of what heroism is. So I didn't want to do that. So yeah, the women I read, um, all these women that I, I mentioned, they gave me the go ahead. They said it's okay for me to tell the stories. So yeah, I highly recommend them. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh yeah, I like I like the fact that you use the phrase patriarchal bullshit. Huh? <laughs> I really love that. I love that <laughs> phrase, you know, and uh and uh big up to Neka Leslie Arima, who's an absolutely brilliant writer. So yeah. I'm glad I'm not just the the only one. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, so you moved to the United States a few years ago to, for the Iowa Writers Fellowship, and currently you teach in uh, Vermont. Uh, like this is a, a world away, you know. I imagine a world of differences away uh, from Nigeria. Uh, can you tell us about your ongoing American experience huh? uh, related to this? Because I am very, very curious. How has living and working in America shaped and affected your writing? You've spoken a little bit about this, the emphasis on craft. Uh, so, but you've come a long way since uh, Eyes of a Goddess, you know, what were the things you took for granted then, which you know better now, you know, between your Nigerian experience and your present uh, ongoing American reality yeah. or experience, however called. Yeah, moving away from home gave me an outsider perspective. There is something that happens when you are just living at home. You take so many things for granted. And there are things that you see around you that you don't pay attention to and you don't know that they are really some of the enablers to the problems in your community or they are what makes your community, they are part of what makes your community better. So what living 
uh, moving away from home did for me was it gave me an outsider, outsider perspective. Now I had an insider perspective living all my life in, in Nigeria. And then moving away, um, that distance, that emotional and physical distance allowed me the opportunity to interrogate home, to see what we are doing better at home, what we can do better. And then also what um, moving away did for me was it made me realize what we take for granted, like the things we really take for granted, the little conversations on the on the streets, the little support we get from our women, even the women in the buses and in the market, the kind of comments they make, how they uphold us. Because reading um, lots of American and British feminist literatures, I had this idea of what feminism is, is or should be. But what I've been doing most recently is the Americanizing myself and like totally embracing home and and by embracing home it's paying attention to what we do at home um going back and reflecting on my past reflecting on the conversations i had in the past also reflecting on even the current conversation i have with my family each time i conference with them each time we have our video conversation even my larger extended family the little things they say how they prop me up how they support me because there's something that happens when you move to the United States. It's this place, there's, there's so much individualism here, unlike at home where it's more of a community. Like in, in where I come from, in southeastern Nigeria, uh, a, a wife belongs to the community. You're not just married to the man, you're married to his brothers, you're married to his sisters, his cousins. Everybody calls you my wife. Um, and it's in a good way, it shows acceptance. It shows that they care. Like I'm living in the US and I have people who are constantly looking out for my children who are constantly checking up on them. But here in the United States, it would take, I don't know what it would mean, it would, it would take you physically studying with people and being in the same space with them for them to check up on you because there is so much war between the, the next person and their neighbor. I mean, you could live in an apartment for two years and your neighbor will walk past and, and, and just say hi, Hi, quickly and, and walk away, or they will see you come in and they walk off the curb. Unlike in Nigeria, your neighbor will just walk past your window and be like, Uka Maka, have you said good morning to me today? <laughs> you look, you look, ah, you look thinner. Have you eaten? Uka Maka, is everything fine? And like we don't, we don't, we don't. <laughs> we are so intrusive. Sometimes it can be very annoying, but it's in a good way. Like you don't, you don't even have time to be sad. Because everybody's in your space. <laughs> everybody's asking, why are you not smiling? Why, 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 why are you squeezing your face? Uh, is everything fine? But here you would squeeze your face and nobody says hi. Nobody cares. They walk away. They, they have their own things to battle. So yeah, so that's what I'm bringing into what I'm writing most recently. That communal experience, that communal joy, that communal living and shared atmosphere, you know, shared experiences. That's what I'm bringing in. And I didn't... I wasn't paying attention to that when I lived um, in Aba. I wasn't paying attention. But then I moved here and transitioned into this really isolatory lifestyle. And I realized, oh, my fucking God, <laughs> we were living in heaven. <laughs> I was living in heaven. <laughs> and then I moved here to purgatory for academic pursuits. Yeah, and so each time I call my family at home, I want to spend forever. Like I would spend three hours talking to people at home because I fucking miss that. Um, I don't have that here. So yeah, so that's that's what it did for me. That's uh, what the distance, the physical and emotional distance, has done for me. And I, I am, um, I am mirroring that in in all my recent stories. Yeah. You know, it's it's quite an interesting inversion between where hell exists and where is heaven. So it's. <laughs> It's interesting, and I think I think this informs my my next question. Uh, I hope the God Squad do not come from my head. But uh, uh, on a serious note, I think that religion has been the biggest enabler of patriarchy and unfairness between men and women, uh, especially in Africa. Religion has been the greatest enabler, particularly the orthodoxies of uh, Christianity and Islam vis-a-vis uh traditional religious practices the roles of religion and feminism in nigeria how has this affected you as a person you know and what what does it mean you know for a young woman today religion versus feminism side by side feminism what does it mean for a young woman today um what it means for a woman today i think 
the woman today is asking a lot of questions. Unlike in the past, um, when we just take in everything that is fed to us in church, where we don't ask questions, we don't interrogate the Bible, we don't even challenge the Bible. How dare you? You will die in hell and you you will never come out of it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but then what we are doing today is we are asking a lot of questions and, and with exposing ourselves, having, having this conversation, what it has done for me is to realize that, yeah, the word feminism is very Western and our grandmothers, my and grandmothers, I mean my great, great grandmothers, the women who came before me, they were really active in their community. We had a very matrilineal culture where children belonged to their mothers. I didn't know this until I started asking my father questions. And he told me, and I even pointed out to a family, my closest family at home, who still identified themselves by their late great grandmother's name. Because before the missionaries came, all children were identified by their mothers. But then the missionaries came and then they said, oh no, the, the children belong to their father. So they introduced the son name, the father's name. They said uh, a, the woman came from the man's rib, according to the Bible. They said God is a man, even though before um, the introduction of um, the Christian religion, we had women you know, serving as mediators between the people and their gods. I mean, one of the greatest evil gods and me is a woman. But then religion mm. came and demonized all of that. And then it threw us like a hundred step backward. And what we then did, and because of um, how the, the demonization of the African religions and African religion and also African cultures, we our writing systems, most of them were even, I mean, in my community, most of the writing systems were, were burned because they felt it was too hidden. And what happened is we now accepted everything we were fed um, by, by the missionaries and we married that with our culture, the remembrance of our culture that we held on to. And the synthesis is what we have today. The synthesis is what um, gave birth to the atmosphere that in which girls like Ogadema succumbed to, girls like women uh, or girls um, of my mother's time in the 80s, the reason why they were all shipped into uh, marriages with much older men who were really iron clad Christians who enforced every word of St. Paul in the Bible. You are told to submit, you are told not to question the man. So what, but what's happening today is that we're asking so many Christians, we are challenging those norms, those synthesized norms. Um, we all, and it's all thanks to social media. Social media gave um, people the opportunity to speak. Now, um, you don't need anybody's approval to tweet, to post on Facebook, to create a community. But in a typical Christian community in southeastern Nigeria, before you even form, say, a woman's association, you will need the permission of the man to do that. And then they would have to um, serve as intermediary, even between you and whatever affairs is happening between you and other women in that community. They can even decide or, or wake up and decide, no, we're going to shut down the association because you were not submissive enough. And that's thanks to religion, thanks to um, um, the Christian faith. But what social media did is that most women now decided to create their own communities without seeking for those permissions. And then they began to have conversations that are necessary. They began to um, interrogate their past. They began to pick apart the things that they've been fed. So yeah, so that's what um, also happened. Um, in a way, it happened to Ogadema, but then there, there wasn't social media for her. It was um, becoming friends with Ejiro a girl from a different culture who sort of opened her eyes and told her it was okay to come into her own person. So yeah, that's what I did. And then one thing I was there to deliberate in my in the book was to try not to, to wrap her entire experiences around the Christian religion so that when she eventually left, she felt no sense of loyalty to the Christian faith. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, so yeah, I appreciate that. I think it's it's important for us to have these uh, conversations, you know, and even here in Northern Nigeria, uh, my friends, young people who are young in their 20s and in their 30s, such as me, I have three younger sisters. 
they have a new, they, they've come into their own again, confidence, they have opinions, they are well educated, you know, and they have those opinions. So they are channeling a strength belonging to our grandparents, you know, and other generations. So I think it's important that these conversations are, are had and uh, that you're one of those women who is, who is also at the forefront of that. Um, so uh, perhaps this is time to have a second reading. Um, this time centered on Ogadima herself. You know, she's a character who changes a lot in the course of the novel. So uh, would you like to read something for us about, um, you know, Ogadima's change? Okay, yeah. Um, I'll read from part three. Um, that's chapter 18 on page 216. 18. Ogadima sat on the bench by her door, a plate of bread and a car resting on her lap. Small children, who looked no more than five year old, sat by her feet, watching keenly. On the other side of the yard, mothers were in the out kitchen, pounding things in mothers. Older children hunched over basins filled with plates or clothes. The yard was awash with morning activities. She returned her gaze to the children. They were waiting patiently for her to share the food. The week she moved into the yard, their, mo their mothers pulled them close when she walked by. But by the following week, the children began to hang around her doorstep. One morning, as she ate a breakfast of bread and akara, and the children came around, she shared the food with them. She did the same thing the following morning. Soon, the mothers, the mothers began to raise their voices when they exchanged greetings with her, and all the children kept buckets of water by her door, their silent way of welcoming her. Now, she reached into her plate and began to share the breakfast. Auntie, thank you, each child said. Just then, one of the fathers ran out of his room, shouting in Yoruba, a transistor, transistor radio pressed against his ear. Everyone turned to look at him. Ogadema strange to understand what he was saying. The language was still strange to her ears, and she could only make out the word "ku ku." He, in his sputter of animated speech, he dashed out of the gate, and everyone followed. Outside, a crowd was thickening. Excited men and women dancing and chanting and pouring down the street, and it was only then that she learned that the head of state and the deputy had been overthrown and another soldier had installed himself as the new head of state. One of the mothers, Mama Kunle, came and stood beside her. God will hear our prayer, the woman said, her eyes lightened by the smile that stretched her tribal marked cheeks. What if the new person called was past the old one? Okadema asked her, remembering her father's words about soldiers being nothing but thugs, Remembering Toby's experience too. I no trust these people. All of them are the same. At least we go see food shop, Mama Kunle said. Later in her room, she heard the cries of the baby. A neighbor at the back had given birth to a baby girl who cried often, shrill sounds that rang out without end every night. She cried like Ibka. Newborns in Lagos cried with the same accent. She pictured Aunt Ngozi bathing Ibka singing him Ibolulo rice, creaming his body with fierce baby lotion, pouring generous amounts of powder on his groin before wrapping him up with a nappy. And something tugged and pulled her heart painfully. The new feeling warmed and worried her. All those days with Ibuka, she had felt no pull towards him. Now it hurt when she thought of him, when she remembered how he suckled, and she did not know what to make of these feelings. It had been more than three months since she left Tobey and her son. She was still dependent on handouts Ijiro often gave her, her future as hazy as the air in Hamatan. She had not been able to keep a good job since she moved into the apartment, a stint at a restaurant which she left after a leery man slapped her bottom, a poorly paid cleaning job at the bank which she hated because the staff and visitors always peed on the toilet seat and did not flush their shit. She thought she had found a perfect job at a local supermarket, but then burglars struck one night and cleaned out the store. One month had passed since her last job, and she had yet to wrap her mind around her situation. P 
people were people who could afford it were quitting the country and living in droves, packing their things and living with their families, not minding the flattering adverts begging Nigerians not to begging Nigerians to stop checking out. She turned on the TV. The news of the coup had already made was already making headlines. Journalists poured into the streets to interview excited Nigerians who praised the new head of state for, for rescuing Nigerians from the former detector. A familiar face appeared on the screen, Kelechi. He had not changed at all. He grinned widely as he talked about how he was pleased with the new military government. The camera panned over his business place, a construction company in, in the eastern city of Aba. The address printed in bold black, bold black ink. He was still talking about the state of affairs in the country, but other Dima could no longer hear him. Instead, she was looking at his face, at the soft line creasing his brows, how animated he looked. This was how she would always remember him. Pleasant face, warm smile, a welcoming demeanor. How nice it would be to see him again. Her mind was muddled by uncertainties. She should have nothing to do with him, not after what happened between him and Tobe. She turned off her TV and went to stand by the window, looked out the compound, which had now filled with noisy children. Baba Kola, the house caretaker, came out of his room and yelled at the children in a sputter of Yoruba, and they all quieted down, only for a moment, before their voices rose again. In a few months, she would run out of money and she would no longer be able to afford this place. And for how long would she depend on Ejiro? She turned away from the window. What should matter to her was how to pay her rent and buy her own food, nothing else. And if there was one more person she could reach out to for financial assistance, it was Kelechi. So she made up her mind to find him. So I'll stop here. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed uh, listening to that. Yeah, so there's there's a sense there's a sense that uh, writing necessarily involves sacrifice, right? You know, something has to be given up for the writing. I personally have been asked, how is it that I find time to write? And I generally think that most people are disappointed because I think I'm a flippant uh, writer who multitasks a lot, you know. But you are not like that, uh, are you? Um, there's a share quality and, and, and then of your output. So what did you have to sacrifice for this? What's the secret? What's Ukamaka's secret for getting the writing done? Richard, I sacrifice my social life. <laughs> and I don't advise anyone what to do that. Like my social life totally went out of the window. I am pursuing a PhD in English on, uh, with a specialization um, in creative writing. I am writing. I have. Uh, I am also teaching English composition to two sections of um, freshmen. I am grading about forty-four papers every week. So yeah, um, and then I I am so stubborn with my literary. Pursuit. I am a literary citizen and I am not going to quit anytime soon. So what I sacrificed, my social life. <laughs> I hope I get it back very soon. <laughs> I, I hope to get it back very soon. So that's what I sacrificed. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's enjoyable, but then it's also painful. But I look forward to um taking a break from writing. Maybe um after I churn out the materials I have um accumulated over the past two years. Then maybe I'll take a break for five years and then have fun with myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let, let, let me be honest. In, in a world where social life has become social media life, you have not missed anything. <laughs> so don't worry, you've not missed anything important. Uh, would you like to talk about what it means to publish in the West? Uh, I imagine that the West is a whole new, different publishing terrain, and I think African readers and younger writers uh, would want to know about this. You know, what sacrifices did you make? Uh, what sacrifices were called for? And uh, there's there's always this eternal, unending question of the audience. You know, the audience you're writing to, who it's aimed at, has this changed? 
you know, and the, even the editing process, the editing process can greatly frame the way a book is, you know, that there are concerns, there are dangers, sacrifices, perhaps, you know, would you like to talk about your experience publishing in the West? Yeah, Ari, yeah. Thank you so much for that question. So primarily I write to my Nigerian community. I write first to my Igbo, um, Abagana actually, my Abagana community in Anambra State. I write to my Nigerian community. I'm speaking toward a familiar experience. But then I'm publishing in the West, in the West. And what happens when you publish in the West is you run the risk of having to um, change your voice. Because so at first, I'm, I naturally, I think in my language, I think in Igbo. Now, when I am typing my stories on my laptop, I'm already interpreting myself on the page. And then when it goes through various editorial processes with Western editors, I, began to, I begin to translate everything that has to do with my language, my experiences, even down to things a typical Nigerian will pick up and read and understand. I will have to interpret it because it is so different. Um, there's this wide cultural gap that um, the editors expect you to feel. And when you begin to do all those translations, you, begin, you lose the essence of your story. But then what happened with Ogaden Ma is I, I am quite thankful because my publisher, my publisher at Indigo Press, they're just amazing. And they employ the services of Molara Wood, who is just a fantastic, oh my God, a fucking fantastic editor. She worked on Ogaden Ma, like she took her pen to this book she called out some of my blunders that a Western editor would not have identified. And I am eternally grateful to her for that. She shaped Ogadema into what it is today. So I think that's where I, um, that's one thing I'm thankful for. And one advice I keep giving to anyone, every Nigerian writer I'm close to is, if you're going to publish your book with a Western publisher, please tell them to employ the services of a Nigerian editor to specifically employ the services of Molara Wood or anyone Molara Wood recommends you, um, recommends, because it's important to preserve our voice. It's important to preserve that experience. It's, it's important not to go through all that chains of translation because already writing on, 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 writing on paper or typing your story, already going through another the first level of interpretation and then going through various levels of those interpret interpretations or, or translations for for the Western editor, you begin to lose the essence of the story. So yeah, so that's one of the risks of publishing in the West. But then I, I was able to conquer that um, with Muller Wood and I'm thankful. Uh, yeah, um, we're, we're wrapping up. So uh, there's a very, very important question that uh, I don't I don't want to forget. Could you speak about the language in Afogadima? Your writing is very, very deliberate and it's quite distinct from recent things that you've uh, you've written. Yeah, I remember I read a piece, one of your piece, a long reads piece. So it's it's really, really different. The language is, is different. Um, what decisions went into into making the choice of language for Olga Dimar. What what informed the stylistic choices uh, in this book? Yeah, um, so this is one of the things I learned from reading um, Leslie Mecca Arima. You notice distinct voices between um, stories. The stories are always different. And then you read one, although she has a signature, and this is something I am learning to teach myself. And I did that with um, Ogadinma. I, the language of the book, I, what I did um, that was very deliberate is, was to mirror her experience, to mirror her um, educational background. She comes from a low income earning family. Um, she doesn't have the privilege. Um, her cousin, for example, who, the, who, whose parents are middle class, who, who have access to luxury or a man her father didn't have. So what I did with the storytelling, with the voice, with the prose, was to mirror that, to show kind of a reflection of who Ogadinma really is on the inside. You know, she, she doesn't have um, the advanced vocabulary you would find, say, if you have, if she had, when you compare her conversations with her cousin, 
um, a former, for example. So yeah, so that's what I did. I was very deliberate. And also um, what I also did was to give the writer um, a clear view of her interiorities. So you see when she's thinking out loud or when she's actually thinking, you notice sort of a similarity between the narrator and Ogadima herself. So that's what I actually did. That was deliberate. And that's very different when you re read my other works or, or say my, my creative nonfiction, for example, like it's totally way different. You wonder, oh, is this still the Kamaka over with this? And the Kamaka over with that. <laughs> yeah. So that was very deliberate. So this particular signature, the voice, the language and the prose is very significant to peculiar to this particular story and it stays here. So I move on to something else with a different voice. So that's what I've been doing most recently. Well, uh, don't don't worry. You had wonders from the very beginning that there were at least three Okamakas in this party. <laughs> so I mean, what is five or six or seven more? We are not, don't worry about it. We're not wondering, huh? <laughs> okay, so um, final question. Um, so you're looking out of the window right now. What do you see? Uh, what is the future for young women coming behind you, young men too? You know, I, I think you mentioned that you have two daughters and uh, there's a younger son. Uh, what do you see for them? You know, I'm asking you to be some sort of um, prognostician with a crystal ball, you know. What do you see for them in this world that you are shaping with your literature and your voice? What do you see? What do you see for the younger generation? Okay, yeah, literally I'm looking out of my window and what I see is a tall brick, <laughs> a tall brick wall, red brick wall of the next building. And it's like it's walling me away from everybody. Like there's so much distance and there's so much wall. Like everybody, there's this um, individual suffering or individual joy. Everything is so individual, realistic. And for my daughters, I, I think... I think also this is almost like a metaphor. Also, like my 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 children or my daughters. My first is going to be going to turn eighteen on the twenty eighth of this month, and my second is already sixteen. And what I I am teaching them to do, or I am encouraging them to become, is girls who smash through walls, who will break down that brick wall, and who will ask questions, who will not be ashamed or who will, not, who will not apologize for their boldness. I mean, it's okay for them to make mistakes. It's okay for them to try and fail. But what I don't want is for them not to even try. So, which is which is what I uh, I also did with Ogadema, having gone through all of that, for her to break away from that chain and find herself. And then for my daughters to look at the story and say it is okay to walk away from the situation. And also for the younger writers coming um, coming up these days who are actually ruling our, our literary um, at, um, environment and communities, yeah, that it is okay to challenge. It's okay to write about disruptive women. It's okay to write about vile women. It's okay to write about wicked women. It's okay to send <laughs> women to decide. It's okay to put the man in the back burner for now because men, it is the time of the woman, so it's okay to do all of that <laughs> and to not apologize for doing that. So that's what that's what I am hoping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, my, my favorite name in the world is Neka. Mother is supreme. Huh? And yeah. when, when I have that first uh, child, I'm, I'm hoping I have daughter. I'm interested only in having daughters. So I'll name the first one Neka. Mother is supreme. Huh? So there you yeah. go. Thank yeah, you. so um, thank you very, very much, Ukamaka, for this really thorough, wide-ranging conversation. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on this panel, and I look forward to your next book, to your next project, and all the lovely and wonderful things you're going to be doing down the line. It's an thank you so pleasure. much. Thank you so much, Ari. Thank you for this. Uh, it's such a pleasure. I mean, it's I am so grateful, and especially having this conversation with the person who published my first ever fucking story. I mean, it's, <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. great. When I, when, I, when I said I'm going to have this chat with Ari, I'm like, yeah, I started this particular journey with RA, and then I'm here chatting with RA. I mean, isn't that a miracle? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yes, yeah. Here's, so, the, here's to the next decade. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk about Ogadima. Grateful to Lola Shonein and the team at Aki Festival. 
um, for including me in the panel. Um, this has been amazing and I look forward to visiting home soon and seeing you all physically in person. Thank you. If you ever need a new place to go, you can join me in the world of words. Let me see like I'm nowhere to be found. If you look, you'll find me in a book. Let's take a ride to the past in the back of a phoenix. Let's flow around the moon. You'll never be alone. Now you know where to look. Find me, find you, find the world. Stranger's Guide is not a typical American travel magazine. Our mission is to dive deep into a single location, commissioning work from great writers and photographers, famous individuals, as well as up-and-coming new voices. This year, we decided to go to Lagos. And we are proud of the volume we produced, with original work from some of Nigeria's best writers and photographers working with luminaries like Wale Soinka, Molara Wood, and Femi Kute. We think this is a very special volume, and we're so excited to bring it back to Lagos. Visit myspectre.com to get your Spectre experience. Spectre. Loans in five minutes.